going to share just a word just to get us started over this. Uh, while I've, I've shared this a couple of times now, but I want to bring it to you at the beginning of this conference for a simple reason. And it's that we, we tune in to what God is, is saying. We live in a, in a time where there's a, a multitude. That's okay, I'm fine about it. With a multitude of voices coming into our, our, our minds, a multitude of voices. We live in a Facebook age, and, and I use Facebook, as I know many of you do. I'm friends with many of you on Facebook, uh, WhatsApp. Uh, it gets, we, we were talking in our trustees meeting about how difficult it is to communicate with people today. It used to be in the old days that there was just a telephone. Uh, and yet you lifted the phone and that's all. And you knew it. if anybody was going to be contactable, they would have a phone. Now uh, we have one group in Kenya that we're on their accountability, a couple of young missionaries, and they only use WhatsApp. So it's WhatsApp we have to have had to, had to get the WhatsApp app so that I can keep in touch with them. Then there are other people as I'm traveling. There's one guy in America, he only texts. So if I want to go to his church, I, I have to text him. There are other folk, folk only use Messenger, so I have to remember I'm using Messenger with them. Uh, and then, uh, you know, is it better than it was? I'm not sure, really. It's a little bit more complicated. But if you're a Facebook person, you have Facebook, you'll know that you'll get all sorts of wonderful things on Facebook. I mean, you can, I thank God for it, because when I was in Pakistan last time, I was able to put videos on the same night or the next morning in the hotel where I was. So people praying for me in America saw the video of the meeting the night before. I mean, that's fantastic to be able to do that. I love being able to FaceTime Kathy and the family when I travel. Modern technology can be a tremendous blessing. But you know, there's a lot of stuff on Facebook. People tell you when they're going to bed. And, and when they're having a cup of coffee and, and they're having a, a, a date night with their wife, I think that's the craziest one. Who cares if you're having a date night with your wife? Just go and enjoy your date night. Don't tell the whole world about it. But the, the multitude of words that come in. But where, where sometimes it is if somebody puts on uh, that they've got promotion or that they've been blessed with something, you get then a, a multitude of, of comments on after that. Now you can tell I read them, can't you? There's a, there's a multitude of comments after that that says things like, you deserve it, couldn't happen to a better person, and, and that I'm really pleased for you, and what a wonderful man, what a wonderful woman, and everybody on Facebook is wonderful. <laughs> and, and sometimes, it's absolute utter nonsense. Would you agree with me? I agree. Yeah. So here's the question I want to ask you. <laughs> There is, no, there is a question, really. I'm just going to... I, I was... She, when, I, when, I, when I'm in the car with Kathy, I talk a lot. I know you can't believe that, but I do. I talk a lot. The other day, I was driving somewhere, and I was telling Kathy, these pearls of wisdom, honestly, you wouldn't believe it. They were just... It was like they were direct from the throne of heaven. And I looked to my left, and Kathy's eyes were closed. She had zoned out... Can you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the question I want to ask you is, does God ever zone out on you? I mean, do you prattle on so much that even God gets bored? That's the question that I want to ask you today. And my answer is yes. I'm going to come to a conclusion today that yes, you bore the pants off God sometimes. And I want to explain why I'm going to say that. Sometimes God zones out. Do you think it's possible that God would get so bored with listening to us that he goes into another room and shuts the door and says, I just, I just, I'm fed up listening to you. Do you think it's possible? I'm going to suggest today that the answer to that is yes. In our grace preached filled world where everybody is beautiful, Everybody is wonderful. Everybody does things that God just uh, winks his eye at. It doesn't matter what you do, how you live. God loves you. He couldn't love you anymore. You're his favorite. So I want to ask those questions. My title today is Ignored by God. And I want you to think about this. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. Because it's helpful if you don't. But I want you to think about this. And the reason why I'm sharing it at the beginning is that throughout this conference... You will hear some things that will be from the Lord. 
And you might hear other things that you'll have to say, I'm not sure about that. That's okay. The Bereans went home and they took the words that Paul said and they examined them to see if they were right. Because if some Lulu comes to you this week and tells you, I think you should go to China, don't book your ticket. Just wait a wee while. Because it happens. The first passage I want you to look, to look at is Judges chapter 6 from verse 12. And Kelton's going to stick them up on the, on the screen for me. Judges chapter 6, 12 to 16. I'm, uh, I'm not sure what verse is it. Either King James or Amplified or something. Judges chapter 6, 12 to 16. And I'm asking this question. Does God zone out? And he appears to do so when he's talking to Gideon. Let me just explain it to you. Let me read a little bit. And I'll read the passage. This, this is New King James. Let me read it as it comes on the screen. Because I have it in front of me here. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. That's Gideon. And said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And so Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now I went through this passage, and what I did on my, on my own notes is I've, I've written uh, God's words in red, and I've written Gideon's words in blue. And I'm going to read them to you as if there are one conversation. This is what God said. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of courage. Go in this might, you, and you shall save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man with me. And that's also a logical bit of prose. It's almost two conversations. And, and it is a conversation. And in the scripture, the way it presents it is the way that it's there. But when God says, first of all, to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty, mighty uh, warrior. And Gideon gives his answer. God does not reply to his answer. When, when God said to him, go in this might, Gideon could well have said, Lord, have you not been listening to one word I've said? Where are you, God? I've, you see me in a wine press. You see all the, the, the wheat here. You see the Midianites. I'm petrified. And yet you're telling me I'm a mighty man. What is it with you? And God says, go. But Lord, how can I? God says, I'll be with you. And there are two. It's almost like there are two different conversations. And I want to suggest that God is ignoring Gideon. Because what he's done is he has spoken to him in a particular language. And the way that I'd like to look at this, I've just come back from Guatemala last week. And I've been trying to learn Spanish. And it's, it's very difficult, you know, when you, you after you've gone for your, you know, uh, your, uh, well, café, café, that's your por favor. After you've gone after your white coffee, you know, you, you then maybe struggle a little bit. I go with Osmond, you know, to, to the Ivory Coast. And, and uh, we laugh about it because his French is about as good as my Spanish. And all, all we can do between us is we can tell the, the taxi driver to go, a gauche or a duat or a gauche or a duat. But after we've done that, there's not a lot more we can do. <laughs> and when you're with somebody and, and you can't speak their language, then actually there's a problem. There is a problem. I've been there. That's why I'm trying to learn. I try to learn little bits in each language before I go. Because there's a problem if you can't communicate. Yeah. And sometimes when we come to God, we speak the wrong language. And God does not communicate to us if we don't speak in the language that He understands. Now, I, God, can, God can do anything. Don't get me wrong. But when we come to him with this language, Gideon came along and said to him, I'm afraid, I'm frightened, I'm stuck in a hole, I'm the least of my father. And, and God's looking at him and saying, I, I don't know what language you're speaking, but I, I haven't learned this one. Where did this language come from? Because it certainly didn't come from me. So it's a, there's a slight, there's a bit of a disconnect between what God is saying and what Gideon is saying. Now turn with me to, to uh, Genesis chapter 21. The three passages I want to, I shared these at, at uh, Bristol last weekend, but I want to share them with you today. Genesis chapter 21, and it's the story of Hagar. 
And when I was driving, why I've been thinking about this was from the court, the IGO conference in Cornwall, Alan, Pastor Alan Carlin spoke on this verse, and I've been thinking about it ever since. It's the story of, of Hagar. And Hagar, as you know, was the alternative. When, Abra when, when Abraham, when children were not coming for Abraham and Sarah, it was Sarah's idea. Sarah said to Abraham, take Hagar, our maid, and maybe God will give us children through her. She gets pregnant and they have Ishmael. Ishmael is then 13 years old when Isaac, the son of promise, is born. And in this passage, in Genesis 21, they're having a dedication ceremony for Isaac. And during the ceremony, Sarah looks up and she sees Hagar over in the corner sneering at her. At least that's the way she interpreted it. It might have been a hormonal way she saw it, I don't know. But that's, what, that's the way she read it. And so, she said to Abraham in Genesis 21, get rid of this woman. I don't want her in our presence. I don't want her living with us anymore. Get rid of her. Abraham is upset because Ishmael is his son. So God speaks to him and says, Ish, uh, Abraham, I want you to obey your wife. Do whatever she tells you to do. And so he does. And so he sends Hagar away with some water and something to eat and, and sends her away. And she goes and she sits. And this is Genesis 21 verse 16. Oh, thanks, Kelton. You're, you're keeping up with me. Isn't it great to see Kelton back, by the way? He was, last year he was on video. Give him a good welcome, would you? It's great to see Kelton back amongst us where he should be. And Sharon. Yes. All right, okay. Good. Genesis 21 from verse 16. It says, there, yeah. Then she went, that's Hagar, and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy... So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. Now what I want you to think about here is, this, this is the, she, she lifted her voice and she wept. Now when she lifted her voice, she was crying, but she was also praying. She lifted her voice, she's praying to God, God help me. Because she's got no future, she's been thrown away. But look what it says in the next verse, verse 17. And God heard the voice of the lad. It doesn't say God heard her voice. Now, I'm sure he did hear her voice. But it doesn't say he heard her voice. After her crying, it says he heard the voice of the lad. What did the lad say? We don't know. It doesn't say the lad said anything. But it says, Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not. Not for God has heard you, but God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Now, what was the lad in Hagar's life? Hagar, as a woman in those days, as women today, there's the desire to have children. She had to have a child. That was, in a sense, in the context of when she lived, that was her vindication, to be a woman. It was almost a disgrace in those days to not have children. What's wrong with you? The man could go off with as many women as he wanted, as long as he got children. She, this Ishmael was her child. This was her promise. This was what she wanted from God since she was a girl. And God says, I haven't heard your voice. I've heard the voice of the promise. In Genesis chapter 2, about verse 20, Exodus chapter 2, it's about verse 24. It says that when the children of Israel were in Egypt, it says that they cried out to God in their slavery. And their groans and their cries rose up to heaven. God heard their groans. And he remembered his covenant. And what we have to understand as people in this age in which we're living in. In our Facebook age. God isn't interested in our Facebook posts. He's not interested when we're going to bed. I'm sorry when people say he's interested in heaven. Listen, get alive. He's not interested in the time you go to bed. Unless you're sitting up all night and watching nonsense. It's, God couldn't give a hoot what time you go to bed at. Don't put God down to those sorts of trivia. In the bigger scheme of things, he couldn't give a hoot what time you go to bed at. It's not an interest to him. We're not talking his language when we talk to God at that level. Now, of course, I'm an extremist, as you know, and uh, you'll, people will come back to me and say, you know, maybe he is interested. But on the bigger scheme of things, God is a legal God. And God is a God who works according to the criteria he has set. 
If you read certain books and you allow your mind to go in with just grace, grace, grace without truth, you will logic yourself out of there being a hell. You will talk yourself out of it. You will talk yourself out of any judgment. You will talk yourself out of anything that God would ever do that wouldn't be nice and loving and kind. And that's what will happen. Because we come to God in a language that he doesn't understand. Because he hasn't chosen to communicate to us in that language. And it's just the same as me sitting in Guatemala trying to communicate with these ladies and gentlemen in their homes. And, and they just don't understand me. Why? Because I'm not speaking the same language. As soon as I have an interpreter who says what I'm saying, their, their faces will light up. Ah, that's what you were saying. Come on in, Bob. Good to see you. God bless you. You're welcome. <laughs> and when we speak at that level, then people's eyes light up and say, yes, there's communication that's about to happen. And in this passage here, God hears the voice of the promise. Not the voice of the good intentions or the voice of the nice thinking, oh, you deserve it. What's deserving got to do with anything in church? It might have its place in Facebook, but it doesn't have its place in our prayer life or in our legalities with God. Because God doesn't work at that level. And I want to encourage you in our time together here this week that when we hone into what God is saying, when you hone into what God has said to you over your lifetime, you'll have had a multitude of things said to you. Some of them, if you're a pastor particularly and you're in the city, you'll have had people coming up giving you all sorts of advice, telling you how to run your meeting, telling you how to do this. Some of you will have people that God will have allowed into your life and they're a pain in your neck and you're honest. I know you love everybody but you wish God would give them a missionary call. A one way you'd buy their one way ticket if you had the, the, the right to do it. Maybe that's just me. But the nice things that people have said to you isn't going to chase the devil out of your life. It's the word of God that will do that. And it's the Rima word that God gives to you that will get you where you need to go. Yes. When Jesus walked away from John the Baptist when he was in prison, when Jesus knew that John the Baptist was going to lose his head, and yet he preached to him, he said, when John the Baptist said, hey, how do we know if you're the one? Well, he did know because it, it, he actually saw the Holy Spirit rest. He knew. But he sent that through his disciples. And he, he said back, he said, listen, the blind, the blind see, the lame walk. And the whole miracle ministry. And then he said good news will be preached to the poor. Why didn't Jesus, John the Baptist was one of the poorest people at that time. He had nothing in prison. Good news to John the Baptist would be that Jesus came along. He could well have said, hey cuz, I'll tell you what I want you to do really. Forget this preaching all around the world business. Come and get me out of prison. But he didn't, he left him there. And he knew he was going to die there. Why? Because the, the word that was for John the Baptist was that he would prepare the way for the Lord. When Jesus came, he had finished his mission. When God spoke about Paul, he, he said to Ananias, this man will suffer greatly for the kingdom. When the, the elders at Ephesus and the people at Caesarea tried to stop him from going back to Jerusalem, he said, why are you breaking my heart, guys? I'm ready not only to go back to Jerusalem to go to jail, I'm ready to die. Why? Because God's already told me some things that you aren't, your words are not going to influence. In fact, you're speaking the wrong language to me. God's spoken to me in a language that I understand. And I know this thing's. You might think it's not going to work out good. But it's going to work out exactly the way God wants to, it to work out. God spoke to Jeremiah and said, I'm going to call you as a prophet to the nations. And so what I'm coming to today is this idea of knowing the word that God has given to us. Because the, the whole medium of good intentions and niceness. It's nice to be nice, I get that. None of you want that written on your tombstone. He was a nice man. She was a nice... I've got no danger of that being written anyways. I'm not worried about it. But who wants to be a nice man? Because it doesn't cut it with God and it doesn't cut it with the enemy. So here in this passage, God says, I've heard the voice of the promise. I've heard your son crying out to me. Turn to Mark chapter 5. And let's have a little... Are you with me this, this afternoon? Yeah. I'm not starting off too heavy, am I? No, wonderful. Oh, thanks, Lynn Marie. I love you. 
Mark chapter 5, and, and uh, just, just look at where it talks about Jairus' uh, daughter. I can't remember, the, I can't see my Bible, so I don't know where it starts. Somewhere halfway through the passage there, where it, where it talks about um, Jairus. He got out of the boat. Jairus didn't get out of the boat. Jesus got out of the boat. Jairus wasn't in the boat. You got that, Kelton, somewhere there in Mark chapter 5? About halfway through. 21. That, that sounds, 21 sounds good. Somewhere between 20 and 22. There you go. Now, let me, let me just walk through this. Because I, I want to show you something. I, I said to you at the beginning, is there ever a time when God or Jesus would actually listen to you and say, I don't want to hear it anymore. I'm going to go into another room and close the door. Because that's exactly what he does in this passage. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. Let's keep on through there. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, and look, here's what language he's speaking in. He's speaking in the language of faith. His, his daughter was going to die. But here's what he says. My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Now he's talking the same language that Jesus talks. So he's guaranteed to get his attention. See that? So, so Jesus went with him. Of course he did. He's met somebody who understands. I can hear an Irish accent a mile away. Kathy and I walking through a mall somewhere. If we'll hear if there's an Irish accent. We hunt them out. I can hear it anywhere. Can we, Kathy can but take it. You hear, when, when Jesus hears somebody speaking in the language of faith, he wants to look them up. There's somebody talking my language. There's somebody who's from the same place that I'm from. There's somebody with the same citizenship that I have. Somebody who shares my passport. This isn't somebody who's just British or Irish or Sri Lankan. This is somebody who's got a heavenly passport. They're speaking a language that wasn't given them by man. It was given them to by God. So, so he stops and he says, somebody, there's one of my kindred is here. Who is it? I can hear your language. Come on, let's go. So Jesus went with them and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And I love this. Verse 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She'd spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Look at this next verse. For she said, for she said, here's the language of faith coming again. She spoke in the language of faith. If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. There's two people in the one passage who are speaking the language that Jesus was brought up knowing. This is his language, not unique to him. It belongs to all those of the household of faith, if we choose to use that language. If only I may touch him. And it says, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, for she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And look what Jesus does. Jesus, immediately knowing himself that power had gone out for him, turned around and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples are speaking a different language. He said, you see the multitude, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about, man? And he looked around her to see who had done this. And he said, no, 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 no. There's somebody speaking my language here. Okay, I'll go on that. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to him, happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And then there's, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your, inflict, of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, and let's, they said, a different language here, your daughter, to Jairus they spoke, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And it's the next verse that's the important one in this passage, verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken in a foreign language, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. The Amplified translates this verse 36. And if you look up different translations at the beginning of this, some it says here in the King, New King James, as soon as Jesus heard, he said. In some translations it says, Overhearing, he said, and in some it says ignore. So look here, the Amplified puts them both together. This is the full meaning of the passage. Overhearing, but ignoring 
what they said. Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear, only keep on believing. There was a danger that Jairus would start speaking the wrong language. So Jesus comes back to him immediately and starts speaking in the language of faith, which Jairus came to him. All he's doing is he's continuing the same language. Turn on, just let's look at the rest of the passage. You can go back actually to the New King James there, please, Kelton. As soon as Jesus heard, yeah, don't be afraid, only believe, on the next verse 37. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Look what he did. He came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. Then he came in and said to them, what is this commotion? The child is not dead, but sleeping. This is the language of faith. She is not dead. Look at this. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them, here's, here's, but when he had put them all outside, he shut the door. Would it ever be that Jesus would say, well, you're prattling on here. He could say it to me goodly often. You're prattling on, you're going on and on and on and on. Give me a break. I've had enough of listening to this negative stuff. I'm just going to go into another room and close the door. Would he do it? Well, it's exactly what he did here. They said to him, the girl, is, she's died, we're weeping, we're in a lost cause. But he says, no, 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 no. Outside. He took the father, the mother of the child, those who were with him, and entered where the child was lying. Then he continues in the same language. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. The language of faith. And then you see the result. Immediately the girl arose and walked for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. Ignored by God. There are some times when we're ignored by God. But it's for our own benefit. It's for our own benefit. Because God has spoken to each one of us. And he'll speak to us this week. He speaks, especially in this age that we're in. We need clarity in this age that we're in. There is so much confusion out there. What is ISIS going to do? Should we open our doors to the refugees? Should we not open up our doors? Jesus was a refugee. Yeah. But what about those that have been sent? And so there's confusion. Even in the church, there's confusion. What's happening? How many more? Uh, you know, there's four blood. We're going to wait till we have ten blood moons. And then we'll start panicking. Uh, and a few weeks ago, you know, on the new year of the, the new Jewish new year, when a lot were expecting the rapture, I dreamt about the rapture, frightened the living daylights out of me. I woke up that morning, I was over in Guatemala, it was on a Sunday. Oh, I was thanking God when I saw Abner and the other folk there. I thought of, because I thought, I didn't think I missed it, but I was a bit concerned. <laughs> but Christians are confused. You've got Christians packing up food, packing up. Water, packing up all sorts of supplies. Let me tell you, there's a word for that. Stupid! Yes. <laughs> Jesus said, take no thought about tomorrow. Unless you think the rapture is coming. Does, is that in there? Take no thought about tomorrow. Unless you hear some preachers telling you that we're in dangerous time. No, take no thought about tomorrow. Tomorrow will have enough trouble for itself. Amen. But seek first his kingdom today. He'll look after you. And to be honest, I mean, if you're going to starve to death, I'd rather starve to death tomorrow than ha have enough food to last three weeks and then starve to death. Because I've got to think about it. No, you're not with me at all there, are you? <laughs> the Lord will look after you. And he'll look after you real well. He speaks in a language that is the language of faith. And when we communicate with him, we need to speak in the language that he understands. And he understands the language of faith. Amen. So we need to speak the same language that he understands. Mm -hmm. So this week, in, in maybe, maybe in, in the words that you hear this week, maybe you can, can, can hone it down you know, to what God has said to you. That's the beauty of IGO. You know, our, our, our ministry, IGO, its motto is recognizing the whole church. Reaching out to the whole world. Recognizing the whole church means that I validate your call. Your call might be different from my call. But we're not trying to make little people who are all the same. 
We're wanting to release you in the call that God has given to you. And your call might be a much tougher call than me. So you might need folk like me to stand beside you and say, Brother, sister, I'm with you in your call. I recognize that, that there's a, a pain that goes along with it. A loneliness that goes along with it. But let's stand together so we can fulfill what God has called you to do. And that's the beauty. That's why God raised up IGO. To recognize people within our ranks who would maybe never be recognized by a church, who maybe would never be identified because you don't fit the common uh, description. But, but God has made you you, and he's spoken to you the way you are. And you have a unique word from God. Mm -hmm. God spoke to me a few years ago, go across this Jordan, help your brothers possess their land. So someone says to me, you're planting churches. No, I'm not planting churches. Why aren't you planting churches? Isn't that what you do in other countries? No, God didn't tell me to plant churches. If he does tell me to do it, then we'll change the strategy. But at this moment in time, I know what God has told me to do. And that's where the guaranteed blessing is. Within the word that God has given to you. If he's called you to be a pastor, don't worry about traveling all around the world. If God's called you to a specific location, that's where he's, if he's called you to be a musician, be the best musician you can. And let's affirm one another within the ministry that God has called us. God has brought this time, he's, we've got a wonderful overseas flavor from Tanzania and from Bhutan and from Nigeria and from Ghana and from, from uh, Romania and from, from the UK, from Ireland, from all over the place, from the US. God has brought us together for such a time as this, so that we can somehow help one another to identify more clearly what God has said to us. You won't get it from Facebook, and you won't get it from Instagram. Where we'll get it from is the Word of God. And I pray that we will help one another in these three days to stand firm to what God has called each one of us to do. Amen. When we, one of the things we always say here in, in our IGO conference is that, you know, these are the meetings, and the meetings are great, the prayer meetings early in the morning, there, there are lots of meetings that go on, but actually also sitting over your meal time, talking to somebody in between the meal time, maybe going out in the afternoon, not everybody has a car who's here, so those of you who've got cars who maybe want to go out tomorrow afternoon, there may be somebody you could invite with you, Take them out to a coffee shop because you'll be hungry, you know, while you're here. And, and uh, buy them a bit of case. That the major problem is discouragement. Because let's face it, whatever Facebook is telling you about me, nobody wants to know about you. That's the problem. That's why we have to put Facebook out and count how many likes and comments we have after it so we feel validated. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in this conference... We could validate each other and just draw somebody out to tell me your ministry, tell me your vision, tell me your heart, tell me your disappointments over since we last met or if you've met before. Tell me, tell me how it's been tough. What's been tough for you in the past year? So I want to know that because I want to be able to pray for you. Tell me what's blessed you in the last year. What are your plans for 2015, 2016? How can I somehow by prayer or even practically or even by visiting, how can I be involved some way in what you're doing. And that would multiply the effect of this conference from being three days just meeting together to actually getting people's lives to, to intertwine possibly forever. So I'm excited about what's going to happen. And I know God won't ignore you over these few days because you're going to be speaking the right language and he will understand the right language. Father, I thank you for your presence today. Thank you for this conference. Thank you for every person who has come. Thank you, Lord, you don't put a value sign over us apart from through the blood of your Son. So each one of us is of, is of infinite value. There is no figure could be put in it. Thank you for the cross. Calvary covers it all. And Father, I thank you today that you love each one. Thank you for the safe journeys and for those who are still on the way, Lord, I pray, continue to bring them safely. Those waiting at airports, bring them here safely, please. And Father, we just pray for these few days that somehow, although it's a short time, you will multiply its effect so that in our fellowship, let it be real fellowship, not talking about the weather, but really interacting over the things of God 
and what you've spoken. And I pray by Friday morning, when we have communion together, before we leave on Friday, I pray each one of us will know, will be able to write down in a sentence, this is what God has told me to do. This is what God said, because I heard it, I heard it in His language, and I understand it. So God, we present ourselves to you, and we say, have your way in our lives over these next few days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 May God bless you.